This is the higher level content from D3.3 on homeostasis, and we'll be focusing in on the role of the kidney. Humans have two kidneys, and the role of the kidney is um, twofold. So first thing it does is it's going to help with osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is controlling the osmotic concentration. So osmotic concentration is defined as osmoles per liter. I like to think about it as the total solute concentration in a cell, and it's very important that that is controlled. The reason why is because when we control the solute concentration, that not only controls just that solute, but it controls the relative amounts of water and then the pressure inside of cells. Because remember, water will move in or out of cells in order to reach that equilibrium. Changes in water content can affect pressure, so it's very important that that be maintained within a narrow limit. Excretion is the removal of toxic waste. Toxic wastes are usually a product of metabolism, so those byproducts of metabolism sometimes can be toxic and need to be excreted. For example, urea, which is a product of protein digestion. Inside of each one of our kidneys, we have almost a million of these filtering units called nephrons, and there's a lot of important stuff that goes on in there. So let's draw one so that we can talk about the anatomy. I start off with this C-shaped structure. So this C-shaped structure is called Bowman's capsule. We'll go through and we'll label that in a bit. And it leads into a structure called the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal means close. It's close to Bowman's capsule. And convoluted means twisty. So that proximal convoluted tubule then dips down into this structure called the loop of Henle. So it looks like this. All right, and then that loop of Henle is going to lead into the distal convoluted tubule, which then leads into the collecting duct. Now, when we say that the nephron is a filtering unit, it's filtering out the blood, so it needs a blood supply. Blood is going to come into the nephron through a structure called the afferent arteriole. So it is slightly larger in diameter than the blood vessel through which it exits called the efferent arteriole. So the efferent arteriole is a little bit smaller in diameter. And then we have this tangle um, of blood of capillaries in here called the glomerulus. So the way that this is happening, blood is coming in through the afferent arteriole. So that's up here. And then it is circling through this um, tangle of capillaries, special capillaries here called the glomerulus. And then it is exiting through the efferent arteriole. And we'll talk Talk about this process of blood entering and exiting in a little bit more detail uh, in a while. But first, let's define these terms. So glomerulus, again, that is these fenestrated capillaries. So fenestrated means it has holes in it. In some language, fensters uh, mean window. So these are literally capillaries with holes in them. And this allows filtrate to be separated from the blood in a process called ultrafiltration. Bowman's capsule is this structure right here. Bowman's capsule captures that filtrate that is exiting from the glomerulus, and then it sends it on to this next structure called the proximal convoluted tubule. At this point, this is where we're going to have another process, which we'll talk about in detail, called selective reabsorption. Let's focus in on ultrafiltration first. The afferent arterial is going to receive blood from the renal artery, that's the blood vessel leading into the kidney, and because it has a slightly larger diameter than the efferent arterial, that's where blood is going to exit, it creates an area of very high pressure. The high pressure is accumulated inside this glomerulus, and that high pressure is going to force uh, molecules out of the blood and into Bowman's capsule. So that glomerular filtrate, again, is going to be the things that are pushed out of the blood and into or captured by Bowman's capsule. This is not selective. It's based on size and charge. So really small, any small molecule, small enough to get through those fenestrations in the glomerulus is going to get pushed out. 
larger things like blood cells and proteins will remain in the uh, blood that's in the glomerulus and will exit through the efferent arteriole. But since it's not selective, there are going to be some molecules that get pushed out during ultrafiltration that actually need to be kept in the blood. So they need to be returned from that filtrate and absorbed back into the bloodstream. And that is called selective reabsorption. It happens in the proximal convoluted tubule. So here I have some cross sections of many proximal convoluted tubules. There's, remember, a million nephrons in each kidney. And so we can see that the cells lining this proximal convoluted tubule are going to be there to facilitate selective reabsorption. So as filtrate is moving through the lumen of this proximal convoluted tubule, some molecules are going to be reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the cells lining the proximal convoluted tubule, and then that uh, those cells will facilitate the return of those molecules to the blood. There are special adaptations of these cells, one of which is microvilli. So it's a bit hard to see here, but each of these cells is lined with these special uh, little finger-like projections called microvilli. So if I were to zoom in on one cell, it would look something like this. And those microvilli, that's these guys here, these little finger-like projections, these are there to help increase the surface area for reabsorption. We would also find lots of mitochondria. So the mitochondria would be visible um, on, uh, in a microscope, maybe an electron micrograph, not a light uh, microscope here. Um, but those mitochondria are there to help produce ATP for active transport. So some things like sodium ions will move from the filtrate back into the proximal convoluted tubule via active transport. Things like chloride ions will follow them. Remember, they have opposite charges. Water can move via osmosis. It's following the high levels of solute concentrations. And then glucose, this is one of the big ones that gets pushed out during ultrafiltration but needs to be selectively reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. Anything that stays in the filtrate will eventually pass through the body and be excreted as urine. Well, we don't want to excrete all the glucose that we worked so hard to eat and digest and absorb. That needs to be selectively reabsorbed. So that's going to move either through facilitated diffusion or through those glucose co-transporter proteins. So from a high level view, here's what's happening. Blood is moving into the kidney and then it's going to go through this process of ultrafiltration. Things get moved or pushed out of the blood and anything that stays in the filtrate will eventually be excreted as urine. So there are some molecules that are not reabsorbed, that they remain in the filtrate and those are things that we want to be uh, excreted. So things like urea or other metabolic byproducts that are toxins. Uh, if we have an excess of salt or if we have an excess of water, um, that needs to be excreted. It will remain in the filtrate and will not be reabsorbed. Molecules that are reabsorbed are going to include glucose and then some amount of salt or some amount of water. And you'll notice that salt and water are on the things that might be reabsorbed but might not be reabsorbed list. And that's because it's the role of the kidney to determine the correct levels of um, molecules to keep and the correct levels of molecules to excrete in order to maintain homeostatic ranges um, of osmolarity. In order to really understand how the loop of Henle works, we need to have a good idea about where the nephron is located in the kidney. So let's go ahead and draw and label the gross anatomy of the kidney. So the kidney has a couple of different regions. So it's got this outer part um, called the cortex, and we'll go through and we'll label these later so we can just focus on drawing for now. And then it's got an inner layer, uh, or I should say like the middle layer is how I remember it, called the medulla. And then it's got this area 
area in the center here called the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis is going to collect all of the filtrate and then we'll eventually send that through the ureter where it is excreted as urine. Now there are two important blood vessels that bring in, uh, or sorry, that service the kidney. So blood is going to enter the kidney, and I'm just gonna show this as going kind of like behind there. It will enter the kidney via the renal artery, and then the blood will pass through those filtering units called nephrons, and it will leave via the renal vein. So I've gone ahead and labeled these. Now I'm going to draw a huge nephron um, to show you how these nephrons are located or oriented within the kidney. So Bowman's capsule, which again contains the glomerulus, is going to be up in this section called the cortex, and that proximal convoluted tubule is also in the cortex. The loop of Henle is going to dip down into this medulla, and then it'll come up and the distal convoluted tubule will also be in the cortex. And then that collecting duct is going to come down into the medulla and will extend into the renal pelvis. Okay, so that has some consequences for how the nephron works because the cortex has very different conditions than the medulla. That medulla of the kidney has a very high solute concentration. You can think of it as being like very salty. So a much higher solute concentration than the cortex. So that is going to cause some really interesting things to happen. The descending limb, that is the part of the uh, loop of Henle that is going down. So descending means to go down. As filtrate is moving through that descending limb, water is going to exit via osmosis. And remember, water is always going to follow a high solute concentration. So that's why water is leaving the filtrate via osmosis. The ascending limb is not permeable to water. What's happening in the ascending limb is that we're getting the active transport of sodium ions, okay? So ATP using are being used to pump sodium ions out of the filtrate and into the medulla. So that's going to maintain the high solute concentrations or hypertonic conditions in the medulla. Without this pumping of salt ions or sodium ions, this medulla would get diluted because of the water leaving it from the descending limb. So we don't want that to happen. <laughs> if it's diluted, then it won't drive this osmosis process the next time that filtrate comes through here. So the ascending limb, which is the part that's going up, has a very different function than the descending limb. So the ascending limb helps to maintain those high solute concentrations. The descending limb is where we're going to see osmosis of water um, leaving the filtrate. Now, the loop of Henle is not the only place where water reabsorption takes place. We're also gonna keep an eye on this part of the nephron called the collecting duct. The collecting duct is a target tissue for a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Now, the antidiuretic hormone is released following monitoring by the hypothalamus. So remember, the hypothalamus is a structure deep in the brain, and it is monitoring osmotic concentration in the blood, so the solute concentration in the blood. It can, depending on that solute concentration, trigger the pituitary to release ADH or not. ADH will increase the permeability of the collecting duct. So if this collecting duct is permeable to water, then water will leave the collecting duct, return to the bloodstream, and less water will be um, excreted as urine. If no ADH is secreted, then this collecting duct remains impermeable and water will then exit the collecting duct and be excreted as urine. Now let's take a closer look at that. In times of dehydration, that hypothalamus is going to sense a very high concentration of solutes, not in the filtrate, but in our blood plasma. 
And because of that high solute concentration, um, we're going to initiate some water conservation steps. The hypothalamus will trigger the pituitary to secrete antidiuretic hormone, and that antidiuretic hormone, we'll show that here, maybe not in blue, um, but that antidiuretic hormone is going to act on this area of the nephron called the collecting duct. It causes more aquaporins uh, to make its way into the cell membranes of the cells lining the collecting duct. Aquaporins facilitate faster osmosis. So this is going to mean that more water is going to leave the filtrate and return to the bloodstream, which means that the urine is more concentrated, it has less water. When we are overhydrated, or maybe just hydrated enough, the hypothalamus will sense that there's a relatively low concentration of solute, and it will prevent the pituitary from secreting ADH. That means that no aquaporins are going to make it into the cell membranes of the surface cells in the collecting duct, which means that it is impermeable to water, which means that the water remains in the filtrate and is eventually excreted in the urine. So the urine will be less concentrated and it will have more water. In order for the kidneys to filter the blood, blood flow needs to be directed to the kidneys. And what's very interesting about our bodies is that our bodies can actually increase or decrease blood flow to different organs at different times when we have different needs. And these changes in blood supply and responses to changes in activity are a great example of that. Arterioles are smaller arteries. So if we think of like arteries as branching off into many arterioles, um, they can control the blood flow to organs um, through uh, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So if we want to reduce blood flow to an organ, you would um, experience vasoconstriction. So there's less blood flow uh, moving through those blood vessels. To increase blood flow to an organ, you would want to um, undergo vasodilation. So that helps more blood make its way there. Now let's track this through different um, times, okay? So we'll take a look at what's happening when we sleep. When we sleep, we have a high volume of blood going to our brain. So this is a very interesting time for our brain. It does a lot of activity while we were sleeping and needs a high blood volume. Our skeletal muscle is going to have a very low volume of blood or low blood flow because we're not moving a lot. Okay, and then our digestive system, this can be variable. So if we did not eat right before we went to bed, um, maybe there doesn't need to be a lot of blood flow there. But if we have food in our digestive tract, then we will need lots of blood volume there to help absorb and then carry away those nutrients. So it depends on um, whether or not we've eaten. Our kidneys are going to receive a relatively low volume of blood while we're sleeping. Remember, the more volume of blood that gets pushed through our kidneys, the more urine that will produce. So in order to not produce a lot of urine and wake us up, uh, the blood volume there is relatively low. Now, when we are awake, but we are resting, um, we're gonna change where the blood volume is going. So our, blood, our brain is going to receive a moderate amount of uh, blood flow, okay? So just enough to maintain brain activities. Our skeletal muscle um, will also receive a moderate amount of blood. Um, we don't need a lot because we're just resting, but um, we still need oxygenated blood and glucose-rich blood in there. The digestive system, again, Again, this is going to be variable based on whether you've recently eaten a meal or not. And our kidneys, this is when it's going to be at its highest. So this is going to be a very high blood volume in our kidneys, up to 20% of all of our blood when we are uh, awake but resting is going to be in our kidneys. So this is the time um, that we're really focusing on the filtration of that blood. Now let's talk about when we are exercising and we're going to think about vigorous exercising, something like running. So in that case, our brain is going to have a really relatively high blood volume. Um, it's very busy to coordinate um, all the things that we're doing while we are exercising. 
Our skeletal muscle is going to need a very high blood volume, and we've got to get a lot of glucose and oxygen to those skeletal muscles. Our digestive system is going to receive relatively low blood volumes. So I like to think resting and digesting, which means that when we are active, blood is diverted away from our digestive system. So if you're planning on exercising, maybe you don't want a big meal right before, our bodies aren't able to carry out um, the normal digestive processes. And our kidneys at that time are also receiving a low blood volume, mostly just due to the fact that that blood has <laughs> um, been diverted elsewhere. So um, a great example here about stability and change um, as it relates to our kidneys. Yes.